Uh, as always, I'm happy to be here and very proud of my association with the Center for Global Business. And uh, I've worked with uh, Roy and his classes over the years and with Mark Wellman as well. And I'm very proud of uh, that association as well. Um, I have to tell you that, uh, by way of uh, point of departure, that I can't think of a more interesting time for us to compare notes about what's happening across the world and what the uh, key issues are. As Rebecca mentioned, I have the benefit of uh, having pretty frequent interaction with business leaders all over the world. Uh, but I also deal with political and uh, academic and other leaders as well. And I think that all of us can agree now that the level of complexity, uh, if you look at the geopolitical prospects or you think about what's happening in the macroeconomic space, or you ask about broader social or even demographic trends, I think all of us can agree uh, that we face a remarkable uh, outlook right now, complex and important. And I would argue that you need to be even more passionately engaged in thinking about this than those of us who are more chronologically disadvantaged than you. Um, the upshot here is that uh, this, is, this is how your, your life unfolds, right? And uh, what kind of contours and shapes and twists and turns uh, the world will take uh, in the years ahead. Uh, so in that spirit, um, I hope that you will not hold fire tonight, that uh, you will uh, ask questions, make comments, or whatever. Uh, I'd love to hear from you in that regard. Now, here's what I propose. We have uh, about uh, maybe, what, uh, 60 minutes together, right, Rebecca? Okay, let's, let's use that wisely. Why don't uh, I uh, filibuster for about uh, 30 minutes or so, lay some, ta some ideas on the table, and then we'll take a pause and hear from you about what you think. Uh, and in the event that you can't keep the momentum going after that, then I'll filibuster even more. So that's an incentive for you uh, to come up with questions and comments. But during my talk, if you feel so strongly about one issue or the other, I, I invite you to consider a two-arm intervention. What is that? That is when you put both your arms in the air, and I promise you I will stop on the spot and recognize you then. But let me tell you, it better be good, the intervention, okay? But uh, that will be fun if we have uh, somebody who would like to do that. Now, Rebecca threw out a range of titles, but my day-to-day -day job is trying to keep up with the world around us, and I think a number of us here share that, uh, that, uh, that commitment. And uh, the issue in doing that is that you can be too easily overwhelmed by the short term, or you can do deep dives and lose the broader uh, breadth of where things are going uh, in the long term. We were talking a little bit before we kicked off here uh, about uh, college teams. And Rachel, where are you, Rachel? Are you still here? Yeah, Rachel mentioned that she was at a school that had a champion chess team. And uh, talking about that, Rachel, makes me think of um, uh, short term versus long term. There are a lot of people uh, in the leader world uh, who are one or two move in advance chess players. And then there are very few who are five or six. And then there are spectacularly few who are able to go into lines that go 12 or 14 or 15 moves ahead or even uh, predict mate in advance. But that's where we want to be, ultimately. Now, we need to be thinking about the urgent and the immediate. To be sure, uh, business leaders need to cover uh, their immediate issues every single day. Uh, but the real, authentic, strategic leaders among them have the capacity to be looking way ahead and positioning themselves and their organizations and their cultures, et cetera, uh, in advance. 
So how do we organize a look at uh, global trends where I am at Kearney? Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, I lead a think tank called the Global Business Policy Council, and I was actually involved in a nonprofit think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, before I went uh, to the private sector. And in both cases, what we do is think about these broader strategic issues and define where they're taking us uh, in the longer term. At Kearney, every year, uh, we do a thing called global trends. And this is a, uh, a deliberate effort to think beyond the headlines, to think beyond the Chinese balloons and the tragic uh, earthquakes that we uh, break all our hearts with the news coming out of uh, Turkey and Syria uh, the, uh, these minutes and hours. Uh, to think beyond that, if at all possible, and to look at a deliberate time frame that takes us out beyond that. So we uh, arbitrarily impose a five-year look out. But I think, as you'll see, as you think critically about the elements that I'll outline here, that many of them are shorter and longer than five years. But it's a good kind of uh, rule of thumb for us to be thinking about uh, how we select uh, what the criteria are for the trends that we identify. We put this out every year, and it's hard to keep coming up with salient trends every single year that apply in the five-year space. Uh, so there'll be some overlap between what we have this year and the trends that I presented here last year to your colleagues, et cetera, et cetera, and that's fine, uh, fine with me. Uh, the more we begin to think in overlapping terms about these complex issues, the better off we'll all be. So um, let's uh, jump into this, if you'll allow me. Um, the five trends that I'll be talking about today meet two criteria. The first one is, what are they and how are they shaping the longer range environment? And the second one is, what can business leaders do to address them? Uh, can they do it proactively? Do they have to do it reactively? What are the key mechanisms or channels by which business leaders try to move things forward? So this year, here's the menu for 22 to 27, 2022 to 2027, that I'd like to share with you. Number one is what we call a pivotal race to climate change adaptation that is underway as the public and private sectors both adapt to the planet's changing environment. Number, and I'll come back to each one of these. Number two, converging shocks that are creating structural drags on the global economy likely to result in protracted stagnation. Number three, data privacy laws are proliferating, raising the prospects of a digital iron curtain. Number four, what about the possibility of a nuclear renaissance? Could we see nuclear reemerge now amid high oil and gas prices and all the bottlenecks and dislocations that we've been seeing in the fossil fuel space. And number five, and finally, rapid advances in synthetic media are enabling next-gen deepfakes as we move into a period, I'm afraid, of post-truth. How do we deal with issues where it's getting more and more difficult to validate claims and assertions that are made in the uh, channels, including uh, social media in which you and I operate. So let's take these apart a little bit. And again, remember that the two-hand intervention challenge is in effect here, okay? The first one is the pivotal race at climate adaptation. Now, no one in the room, no one will be surprised that we identify climate change is one of the key, uh, uh, the key uh, overwhelming forces of change affecting the planet. It's hard to have a heartbeat and not to know about what happened in COP27, uh, that we're concerned now with respect to global warming and a number of issues. But we need to begin here by acknowledging that as critical and urgent and serious as that is, it goes even far beyond it. 
uh, there are whole issues of uh, soil erosion, desertification, uh, a whole range of, uh, of uh, bio uh, issues uh, that uh, we need to be taking into account that go above and beyond, uh, go above and beyond uh, the uh, climate change issue. Now, what we've been seeing here is that there is a very significant shift among countries and companies alike into the ESG space. I can tell you as a management consultant these days, if you're not thinking hard about ESG, uh, you're going to be left behind. Uh, the fact of the matter is that all of, uh, well, certainly Carney and all of our competitors are working hard now to take the high ground in this space. And the same is true with countries. I don't know if any of you have seen the current issue of The Economist, uh, but it has a wonderful cover with the ex with a, a, a char characterization of uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, which, as you know, is inflation reduction, but it's a lot more in terms of an environmental agenda. And The Economist's cover reads, Big, Green, and Mean. And by putting that and by writing about it, as they do, um, in effect, they're highlighting what is becoming a growing competition between U.S. and Europe to see who will take a kind of key position in the green, uh, the chase uh, after green technologies and green policies. Now, I would argue that that is a pretty good competition to have. Uh, but uh, then we have to be careful that we don't resort to tariff and non-tariff barriers and other mechanisms that, uh, in effect, make that competition to achieve the future uh, ever more uh, difficult to achieve. Climate adaptation solutions, if you look at the core numbers, and we highlight this in our report, are vastly underfunded. But we see significant amounts of private and now, now very significant public uh, amounts of uh, commitments, of financial commitments going in that direction. And nevertheless, these efforts need to be enforced dramatically if we can even take a bite out of the overall environmental challenge uh, that we face. Uh, the opportunities are immense, but we emphasize in our report that the costs of inaction or of allowing policy paralysis or policy discord to set us back are even more significant. And we really have to be finding new pathways into the future as we go forward. Now, as you think about all of the dimensions of this first trend, the whole issue of adaptation and mitigation is something that will be with us in virtually every element of business and policy governance in the future. And we highlight a number of uh, specific examples where we think there are some interesting things going on. Uh, there are a few of them that I wanted to share with you. There are many more in the report. Uh, but uh, water, for example, is a critical element now. We see reports of growing water dislocations in the Colorado River, et cetera. And now there are ways that we can find to, through precision irrigation, through other uses of water, to bring new efficiencies to bear in order to create some of the dislocations that go on with this environmental degradation a little more uh, tolerable. Uh, dealing with extreme weather, we know, for example, that new construction technologies are allowing us to create houses now that can build homes with more speed, precision, and less waste than conventional methods. If we think about this broader kind of holistic approach to dealing uh, with uh, the environmental threats that we face, uh, the better off we'll be. Now, we're watching from a global point of view uh, what's happening uh, in the light of post-COVID and supply chains. And we saw with great interest, Roy, you'll be delighted that I mentioned this, but I do it genuinely, a report from the University of Maryland and the supply chain mapping firm Resilink that found that 11% of the 12,000 supplier sites in the US, China, and Taiwan that serve predominant OEMs were fully prepared for climate-related disruptions. So what we find now is that uh, there are very, very significant 
levels of preparedness that can and should be achieved, uh, and it all remains uh, open space into the future. So face it. Uh, whatever you do, however you elect to do it, uh, dealing with the environment is going to be a big chunk of how you deal with the future. Five years and clearly uh, beyond that. All right, so that's number one, and we'll come back to it, but I just wanted to give you a taste of each one. The second is converging shocks. Now, I'm sorry about this, but from the beginning of the century to 2019, according to the new uh, IMF World Economic Outlook, we had average economic growth of about 3.8%. What is it going to be this year? Substantially lower, but not quite as bad as the fund thought last April. That's the good news. But as we think about going forward now, probably, probably, at least by our projections at Kearney, uh, we're seeing a low 3% global output growth future through the end of the decade and beyond. That ain't good news. It's not bad news. It's not like a recession by any means. But nevertheless, what it means is that there are drags on the global economy that will be pushing us uh, into the future. You'll be navigating these drags in a corporate capacity or whatever else you, you decide to do. Now, what are the key elements that are creating this drag, this wind resistance in terms of economic growth? Well, the big one, of course, is US-China. Um, I'll talk about it if you'd like, but let's just think about the news of the balloon this week as emblematic of just how delicate Sino-American relations are at this stage at the moment. Uh, when we think about the two largest economies in the world now and how important that not only it is to have trade and investment between them, but also to be thinking about a range of other areas in which they connect, including, by the way, the environmental agenda. And in the end, we have to find a way uh, to create new pathways into the future. And um, that is a big issue because the specter of economic fragmentation, that is a world in which we see walls built in which trade can't go across between uh, the US and China, um, is very real right now. And if you look at the political climate in Congress, and you'll see it probably tomorrow night during the State of the Union, on both sides, I'm not here to be political, uh, both uh, uh, Democrat and Republican. Um, and then if you look on the uh, wolf warrior side, on, the, on China's side in Beijing, um, you see that there are a number of more populist extremist voices that uh, are playing a role right now in terms of defining where things are going. I heard a very interesting podcast from a New York Times reporter uh, driving out to be with you here tonight. And he said that it might be that one of these wolf warriors released this balloon in order to undercut the possibility of a new stage of diplomacy uh, between my former colleague at CSIS, Tony Blinken, now Secretary of State, and his counterpart in Beijing, uh, building on what was a very uh, a positive or a, a moving toward a positive meeting uh, between uh, in uh, late November between uh, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping in, uh, in Bali. So the whole very uncertain outlook of Sino-American relations is the first of these drags. The second are broader macroeconomic issues. You've heard a lot about inflation lately. And let me tell you a story. Over the past year, I've been asked to forecast where inflation is going. And as inflation kept going up and up and up, I kept telling everybody, stay calm, stay cool, it's gonna drop, it's gonna drop, hang in there. And I said, probably it's the end of 2022 and that we could be back in sweet spot range for the Fed possibly by the end of 23, probably mid 24. And you would not believe the heat that I took. People told me that I was nuts, that I was wrong, that I was a wishful thinker, that I was fronting for the Fed. You, you wouldn't believe it, I heard everything. Uh, but I'm happy to say that it's looking like I managed somehow to uh, get things right. Uh, inflation is coming down. The new Fed data that just came out 
suggest that it was sky high, at, at least by your standards, not by mine. I've lived through much higher inflation periods than this, of 8.8%. Please remember that at the end of last year, 2022, that it could go down, this is worldwide, 6.6% in 2023, and by 2024, down to 4.3%. It was pretty much in that range, spitting range, 3.5% uh, pre-pandemic. Pre uh, so in effect, we've seen this spike and then it's going down again. So if that's the good news, what's the bad news? Well, people are having dislocations. The issue is becoming politicized and it's being used in order to put uh, more parochial economic policies into place in a number of key economies across the world. And that is my next area of resistance on this second trend. If we allow more, uh, more protectionism to occur or more protections in critical sectors, my guess is that probably, probably, uh, we could see things slow down even further. I won't name names, but I was on the plane with a a uh, former senior uh, policymaker a few years ago who was the former uh, U.S. trade representative. And I was talking to him about this notion of, uh, in the U.S., of more uh, momentum on protectionism in some sectors of the economy. And I said, I worry about this, and I worry that we're kind of uh, descending into what economists call autarky, where you kind of make everything in your own economy. And uh, he smiled at me on the plane and said, Eric, we're never going to become a country of pajama makers here. Now, the point of him saying that is that there are sectors in this economy that we can and will uh, continue to, uh, to meet. Uh, but there are some that are just not very profitable and can't maintain uh, the labor inputs and the other requirements that you're studying are necessary for uh, for economic operations, and that the whole prize for the U.S. should be thinking about how we ramp up into higher levels of uh, value, value added at the labor level and also the input level uh, going forward. But uh, I worry that we're descending into a period of kind of backwardism, that what this will mean is not a deglobalization uh, writ large if it happens in other major economies as well, but it could, it could amount to a, a deceleration of globalization, which uh, has had remarkable, uh, remarkably uh, positive uh, effects uh, on, uh, on economies across the world. Then there are broader issues uh, with respect uh, that we highlight in our report with respect uh, to public trust when we think about uh, economics. Uh, there is a, a group called the Edelman Trust Barometer, and you've probably never heard of this before. Uh, but they issue a report every year at the World Economic Forum at Davos. And they interview respondents in 28 countries across the world and ask them about a lot of ideas, uh, how they regard uh, the institutions in their home countries. So whether it's the US or China or Russia or in Europe or wherever, uh, 28 countries, you get a pretty good cross sample of what uh, people are thinking. And uh, what we're seeing now is a lot of hand-wringing about democratization and the whole issue of, um, of uh, the relationship between economic activity and political activity. Um, and in the end, uh, I don't think that's a very positive thing and that that could become uh, a uh, area of resistance uh, on the economy in the year ahead. And what it means is the governments might become all the more parochial, all the more defensive with respect to the policies that they pursue. And we may see that manifest itself in trade barriers and other mechanisms that we see going forward. There are a number of national programs that I could point to that are, um, that are uh, uh, that are identified in our report. Okay, let's talk about data privacy laws. You, whether you think so or not, you're moving into a heavy data economy now. Uh, you may want to work 
uh, in, in heavy steel or uh, some other area, traditional uh, economic uh, area, but uh, it is digitalized, no matter what it is, very heavily. Uh, and the movement of data across the world uh, will be a tremendous factor. And the fact is that the privacy laws uh, on this, these flows of uh, data are growing by the day. Now, what we know is that e-commerce e has already changed your life and mine, and it will continue changing it in the future. Um, if you look at the numbers, uh, they go from south to north uh, very rapidly. I pulled one out in terms of retail e-commerce sales uh, projected by, uh, by uh, Tidio, the uh, online shopping uh, statistics source, suggesting that um, online commerce had gone from something along the lines of 5.5 trillion in 2022, uh, estimated for last year, to a projected 7.4 billion uh, for 2025 alone. Um, and that's no surprise to any of us, really. No surprise at all. Uh, we're all relying more and more on electronic commerce by the day. But the operative question is not what we're going to do, but what governments are going to do. And to be sure, there are a number of companies that are, um, that are uh, in the middle of all this. Uh, I won't say anything about Taylor Swift and the Ticketmaster issue. Is there anybody here who got stuck on that one? Come on, now tell the truth. All right. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. But uh, it, it, was, uh, it was tough all the way around. There are a lot of kind of monopolies now and companies that are taking positions now uh, that certainly raise a lot of issues. But if you look at what countries are doing to address these and other kinds of challenges, you've got the general data protection regulation in, uh, in uh, Europe. Um, you've got a patchwork of regulations here in the US the personal information protection law in uh, China, uh, in Russia, there are others still, uh, there are uh, remarkable, uh, significant web of, um, of areas in which uh, in the future, I believe, um, that uh, countries and companies are going to try to promote uh, their specific interests. I'll leave it there and move now uh, to the nuclear renaissance. There are some of us uh, let me tell you, some of us who would have written off nuclear a long time ago, it was all so obvious to us at the time that fossil fuels were kind of uh, numbered uh, and that uh, we would see a whole range of renewables uh, begin to substitute for fossils over the years, and that was it, end of story. Uh, nuclear, which carried all kinds of issues with respect to storage of waste and long half-lives and proliferation concerns and a range of other factors uh, was out of the picture. Well, now, you know, we're seeing, especially in the light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, but we're seeing very significant uh, issues now with respect to continued reliance on, um, on um, a whole range of uh, fossil fuels and uh, a whole range of nuclear, e even, uh, you know, uh, on the fossil fuel side on, uh, on coal. So the question is then, why would nuclear become more significant? Well, if we look at uh, installed nuclear capacity projections from the OECD and elsewhere, uh, the story is that it is growing rapidly, especially in developing, emerging markets, uh, developing world. Um, the global nuclear power market is expected to grow something on the order of about 1.5% per year uh, driven in particular by advances in emerging markets. Uh, installed production expected to increase 10% from current levels only by the year 2027. And the list where a lot of this is happening, uh, we look at uh, Egypt, the al daba nuclear uh, plant in Turkey, the Akuyu nuclear power plant uh, in South Korea, Shinhandul 3 and 4, uh, Pakistan, the Karachi nuclear power plant, and many, many others. 15 in China in the next 15 years. Uh, really extraordinary. Uh, going up uh, there to a, a potential level of uh, eight annually there with an investment of uh, 440 billion. Um, so we're seeing uh, that a number of people, governments and private sector groups, 
are putting their chips on the nuclear square. Now, more and more, these nuclear reactors are getting smaller, safer, and less easy to use to proliferate because we're likely to see uh, continued uh, development of uh, nuclear weapon powers over the next few years and a range of other concerns that uh, should keep us up at night. And uh, my own view is that many of these smaller reactors won't make it quite as easy for the Irans and the North Koreas and the other groups to, uh, to move forward. All right, last one, and then I'll open things up, uh, noting that we have not had one two-handed intervention yet. I'm disappointed. Rapid advances in synthetic media are enabling next-gen deep fakes. So I'd like to tell you, first of all, that I am not chatbot GPT. And I'm wondering how many of you have been in that site already at AIA? How many? Raise your hand, please. Come on, tell the truth, everybody. Yeah? I, I asked them what the world would look like in the year 2030. And they said, well, it will probably be a complex mix of geopolitical, macroeconomic, uh, social, and broader issues. And uh, my, uh, my uh, reaction to that was, well, yes, but uh, you've got to go a little further than that. Uh, but uh, in any event, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating, especially for those of you who use it uh, in the uh, poetry in the other space. Let's go back to Edelman Trust Barometer for a minute. Uh, Edelman Trust Barometer thinks that there is a bankruptcy in public trust in governments across the world right now, and it documents it in the findings uh, of its uh, trust barometer. Uh, of the percent of populations that uh, face um, uh, worry about false information, the country of Colombia, where I'm going in a couple of weeks to Medellin, uh, will be at, is at the top of the list with 84%. Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Kenya, China, Italy, Russia, South Africa, all the way down, all above 70%. And people, in effect, don't believe what they're hearing anymore. They don't believe what they're hearing from government. They don't believe what they're hearing from broader public policy figures. And do you know the one part of society that they trust the most? private sector. I find that to be a little shocking because in the end there are profound differences with respect uh, to the, uh, the goals of private sector uh, with profit maximization, at least traditionally defined in some of the other areas, uh, with uh, governments of various uh, stripes across the world. Uh, but in the end, uh, what we're seeing now is that a public that already doesn't trust the institutions around it now can't believe its own eyes. What happens when, uh, in effect, uh, you can't even believe what you think you see on TV, a, uh, a Chinese balloon being uh, downed from uh, off the coast of, uh, of the Atlantic or whatever it may happen to be? We expect very significant turbulence ahead on this not only for governments, but for companies. Uh, I would be worried if I were the CEO of a major company, and I know that they are, about deep fakes that might engage their company in one or the other uh, potential uh, allegations or issues that might uh, happen. Uh, artificial intelligence as well. Oh, we have a two-headed intervention. Please stand up. Thank you. Remember, it better be very good, you know. Sorry, hold on. You need the microphone for the recording. And if you could introduce yourself and your class year before your question, please. Gosh, now I hope it's important. My name is Naya. I'm a senior, and I'm taking Roy's class in 466. We're having trouble hearing you. Can sure. you speak in the microphone sure. through your mask? My name is Naya, and I'm a senior. I'm taking 466 with She's Roy. She's a great student. Thank you very much. Um, something I was going to talk about regarding trust in especially companies. I think that a lot of us, especially as we're about to go into our careers, seeing the massive like layoffs by large companies that we otherwise wanted to work for is not really enabling us to have trust in those companies that we wanted to back or had alignments with in terms of culture. And so seeing that happen is forcing us to kind of go into our professional world, not really trusting the people that we're supposed to be working for in addition to everything else that is hard to trust. 
Totally agree. That's all. Totally agree. So you're reinforcing the point in terms of lack yes. of trust. Yes. I, I, I totally agree. And then on top of that, when you get the kind of hyper-partisanship that we're seeing here in this city now, or broader Washington, D.C. area, uh, and then you see it in other political systems across the world as well, uh, this is a real challenge. It's a real challenge. And if you can't maintain the legitimacy uh, through, you know, oh, I, I can validate that because I see it or hear it, uh, then where are you? You really have a sudden decompre decompression of uh, public trust. Exactly. And um, just pertaining to privatization, I know that for our generation, we get a lot of our information from social media or from technology. And even in small ways, like Twitter being privatized by being bought out by Elon Musk allows us to now have a distrust of where we were getting our information to begin with, even though it was social media and to some other people that might not have been a trustworthy source. Seeing as though that then became privatized, it made us then doubt what kind of information we were going to be getting from there as well. Yeah. So it's, it kind of seems like it's hard to have trust already, even in the private sector as well. I agree. And it's a downhill battle in the future. I totally agree. Totally agree. Thank you. Thank you for that intervention. Well worth the two hands. Let me tell you a story. I, I'm motivated to tell one quick story. Um, I was on a, uh, a lake in the middle of Europe. I don't want to be too, uh, too specific on this. Um, at, a, at a headquarters of a large multinational there. And I saw a room of people, who's, young people like you, whose job it was to kind of cut off um, misinformation or disinformation uh, at its source in one way or another. And uh, I can assure you that there are rooms like that uh, all over the world working overtime right now. Um, and they will be even more busy in the future, I think. All right, well, let me pull it all together there, and then let's get into uh, discussion. But think about it. We, went, we covered the, uh, the waterfront here. Uh, we talked about broader physical environmental degradation and the challenge of uh, climate adaptation. Uh, we talked about the uh, potential drags on the macroeconomy going forward, that uh, some of which are new and different post-pandemic. Uh, we talked about a whole range of uh, kind of broader digital issues. We talked about uh, the notion of uh, nuclear uh, going forward. Uh, and then you all confess that you're involved in chat GPT, uh, and so have I. Uh, but we talked about how that's contributing uh, to uh, even more difficulties with respect to our trust in public institutions in the future in a, in a kind of a post-truth world. So where does that take us? Well, it's not all positive, to be sure. But in the end, we've always had a constellation of uh, challenges. And even though these are different from the ones that we've uh, encountered in the past, um, we can do it. We need young people like you with a lot of fresh insight and thinking here and a lot of energy uh, to take these issues on. because. Uh, everything is double-edged. There's not only a set of challenges, but there are good opportunities as well. And we have to find ways to leverage these opportunities. So with that, let me invite you to uh, share with me your questions and comments, and we'll go from there. If you could wait for the microphone to reach you, speak directly into the microphone and identify yourself before you, you uh, ask your question, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caroline. Um... Oh, shoot, I have to stand up. Okay. Um, so this is on to your fourth point about nuclear power. So especially considering, like, the news from Turkey this morning with, like, that massive earthquake yeah. and having that nuclear power, like, being built, um, even though climate change in part caused the push towards nuclear power, how do you think they'll interact in the future considering we can't really even trust the ground we walk on not to start moving randomly and cause, like, massive, like... Um, chain reactions like Chernobyl. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, first of all, our hearts go out to those poor people. The numbers are flying up right now. Uh, it's just uh, awful. Um, and then when you think that, you know, there could be 
a whole range of facilities there. There could be uh, chemicals or a whole range of other, uh, you know, uh, uh, sectors in which uh, there would be vulnerabilities to those kinds of uh, seismic uh, events, uh, and you'd have to deal with them one way or another. Uh, what we think is that going forward, there'll be a smaller modularization of uh, uh, generation of nuclear energy so that um, the, the uh, consequences would not be uh, nearly as severe as, say, for example, or Chernobyl or whatever. Um, so there would be distributed risk there. Does that mean that it, it's not subject to a terrible earthquake like the one we've just seen? Absolutely not. What it does mean is that we're seeing uh, a number of countries that are, are, are economies that are looking to affect an energy transition now, that are interested in using uh, nuclear perhaps as a bridge to get them into a pure renewable type environment in the future. Um, and, uh, you know, we can see this in a number of uh, areas now where nuclear is being uh, re-emphasized. And the sooner that we can bring in the newer, more modern uh, reactors that have fewer risks associated with them, the better it will be. Will it remove all those risks? Absolutely not. Uh, and uh, you know, my, my own uh, personal point of view is that we need to think about it only as a bridge. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we, the numbers uh, certainly support the notion that we're seeing a, a, a significant movement in that direction right now. Okay, Paolo Procano, I'm a faculty at the Management and Organizations area. Professors cannot ask short questions, so here we go. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I'm not talking about any specific trends, but just coming back to the start of your presentation, what can business leaders do about those trends, right? And, and then the, the role of markets in, uh, in that. You mentioned that very few people, a very small percentage, can see 12 moves ahead. Yes. So, markets, the share price does not reflect that. There will always be contrarians, Warren Buffett's of the world that will be making those, uh, would be making those long-term bets, but in general, markets reflect the people that see four or five moves ahead. So then, what can leaders, so for example, Paul Pullman, back in 2009, becomes the CEO of Unilever and says, no, we should go into environment, et cetera, way before ESG was cool. Over the years, the market somehow were punishing some of his moves and to the extent that they almost became a target for uh, Hostiles takeover from Kraft Heinz, which would have changed completely their model. So uh, then it seems that companies are somehow tied, at least um, uh, public companies are tied to also markets and the market's inability to see 12 moves ahead. Is it the only way to think long term uh, to be a private company, or, or what are the implications for governance in what leaders can do? Thank you. Uh, Paul Pullman is a great example. Um, what you said is exactly right. Uh, he's gone on now, as I, I presume you know, to create a group called Imagine! Exclamation mark, which is an action group that is trying to uh, to advance some of the ideas that he had when, uh, way back when, when he was uh, in charge of one of the massive companies of the world. Um, uh, the, timing, the timing of uh, his, uh, his look now uh, was extraordinarily important to the outcome. I, I think he would admit, uh, he would acknowledge that at this time. Uh, the same is true with uh, Hubert Joly, who was at, uh, at uh, Best Buy and tried to put some uh, interesting new policies in place. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there's a landscape of um, uh, business leaders now who are trying uh, to find a second uh, incarnation with respect to uh, achieving some of the earlier ideas that they had. Um, so uh, yes, uh, markets can and do reflect Political systems can do reflect, uh, I'm sure that you're watching as am I, uh, the uh, anti-ESG movement that's developing in the conservative right in this country right now. Um, and uh, there are a number of other factors that uh, would push. It, it, it's a dynamic landscape of moving pieces that make it more difficult to be thinking ahead. 
and then of course the markets themselves. Um, so uh, I think that uh, you highlight what is uh, an important qualifier on all this. The timing is critical. Uh, all of the, the key variables uh, at work need to be taken into account if possible. Um, and, uh, and in the end, um, you know, there's a little bit of uh, sheer luck that uh, goes with the whole thing as well. I can tell you that, uh, and there was an interesting piece in the Financial Times next week, that a number of CEOs are gun-shy right now about getting too forward placed on ESG uh, because they, they, they're aware that a number of their predecessors have faced down very significant uh, issues in that regard. Thank you for that point. Not yet. Hello. Uh, my name is Tarun. Um, I'm a junior right now studying management. Uh, my question is about data. Um, as someone who is going, planning to go into healthcare, um, I know that data is a very big thing that um, is predicted to be you know, a huge driving force in healthcare as well. Um, so kind of going back to the trust point that you made, as well as the, um, the privacy laws that are being put into place, um, I think about, you know, stories that I hear from even my parents about, you know, the stories that we hear about saying something and then getting ads about it or something like that. Um, how can companies, whether they're in a, a place like healthcare to help people or e-commerce making an impact in, you know, everyone's lives, how can these companies do better to inspire more trust with people giving them their data? and kind of build that culture about we're taking data for your own use rather than you know, people worried about what will happen to their data? It's a great question. Thank you for that. Data is especially important when it's personal uh, and when it uh, pertains to your health. Uh, I think it couldn't be more important. Um, I have an elderly mother who uses a breathing device at night and the company, the manufacturer of the breathing device, uh, sent me uh, charts of her respiratory and uh, heart activity. Um, and I said, uh, you know, how did you obtain this? And it was through a cellular link, the link in the device that had nothing to do even with her home Wi-Fi network. Um, and then I asked, well, what other companies have access to this uh, data? answer, well, whoever needs it, we, they requested it. Of, and I said, is her signature required? No, not necessarily. Um, that is a bad outcome, in my view. And uh, I think that uh, a number of sectors uh, will find uh, the data associated with uh, their practices uh, absolutely critical to protect. And uh, health is at the top. What about when you're driving a car? Would you like for me to know what speed you're driving at every given moment or how quickly you take turns or um, you know, what, your, uh, what your steering uh, violence is or whatever you know, index we could assign to that? Um, and it's extraordinary because in the future, uh, we already know that we're moving toward a society with vast amounts of information that can be processed uh, extremely rapidly. Um, and this, the sooner uh, we can find companies that can address this whole issue of trust, the, the longer it may take for governments to try to create the protections on this. But we think that probably governments are going to move on this, perhaps even in a protectionist way uh, in the meantime. Imagine, for example, anybody here in finance? Okay, imagine, imagine if you're the CEO of a major credit card company right now. Um, are you worried about uh, requirements that there may be a kind of a data bank in all of, the, uh, all of the countries that you serve, all of the economies that you serve? And then what is the standardization that you're dealing with in your company? You're ripping your hair out on this right now. Uh, and then you have, you have uh, shifting regulatory landscapes in, in uh, many of these countries as we speak, and you're trying to think about how to deal with it. So that's why we say that this trend is so uh, critical going into the future. Thank you. Uh, 
Uh, my name is Ian, and I'm a senior. And I have a question about U.S.-China relations. Um, so knowing like this week that something like a balloon could an cancel such an important meeting between leaders of both of our countries, and also knowing that people on both sides and both parties in our country, are a lot of them are against collaboration between our countries. And then there's also people within China who are so um, um, also against collaboration. And then them knowing that our policy towards them could change drastically every four years. Um, do you think there's much hope, or do you think there's really a, a viable solution to this polarization? Well, I hope there is. I hope there is. When, uh, when I was a little older than you, i.e. centuries ago, um, I um, read an article in 1989 uh, called The End of History. Any of you heard of this article before? You have. That's great. It's written by my friend Frank Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama, who's the former uh, State Department uh, policy advisor, and now he's at Stanford. He's a professor there. He's well known. If you all have a little time to read End of History, um, do it. I, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an easy... Uh, there's an article that you can read, the first one that appeared that's shorter. Uh, but the gist of it was it's game over. So when I was your age, the game over was that uh, that political uh, authoritarianism and communism were down the drain, that uh, one country after the, the other across the world, from, uh, from uh, Argentina to Brazil to Venezuela, they shed their skin of authoritarianism and were moving in the direction of democratization and democratic institutions. And then on top of that, we saw, uh, they, they, we saw them embrace um, uh, uh, fr uh, free market-based uh, institutions in one country after the next. So you had countries that had hyperinflation in Latin America, for example, that suddenly were not engaging in the statist economic policy, infant industry protection, you know, the kind of vestiges of, of uh, state control that had brought them down into ruin in the first place. So Fukuyama said, game over, game over, that it's the end of history. And now it's nothing but good guys doing good things, you know, economics and uh, politics. Well, now here we are 30, 35 years later, and I'm afraid we may have reached the end of the long wave. Now we see a retreat in democracy. Now we see a retreat with respect to the economic liberalization that defined my career, I can assure you. And so y what you need to be asking yourself now is how you're going to be thinking about what's next. And uh, there are a lot of people who can give you a point of view, uh, but uh, I, I think that the best you can do is read a lot of points of view right now and reach your own conclusion. So now, Sino-American, Sino-American relations. I think, ultimately, that if uh, smart, rational people uh, come to the fore in both countries, even though we know that Xi Jinping has been moving into an authoritarian direction. We know he's moving in an economic program that he calls Common Prosperity, in which he's doing more local and trying to shift the economy into, into uh, internal consumption rather than externally driven uh, uh, economic activity. We know that there, there, there's, uh, there's a pushback uh, in this country, again, to be sure. The bottom line is that both economies pay a big price in order to allow a digital or an economic or any other kind of iron curtain to descend between them. We've run the numbers on this. And for the next 10 years or so, it could go up to some uh, five to seven trillion dollars on each side, their, their variations. But uh, we've run econometric forecasting on this based on uh, scenario planning. Now, in the end, what we know is that we're not, you know, we're going to be anything but right in terms of our projections. But the general story, I think, is, holds that, that uh, by allowing this relationship to deteriorate, uh, we pay a price. We pay a price. Now, does that mean that we have to forge alliances, close alliances with a regime where uh, we see human rights and other practices that are abhorrent to what we believe in. And I'm sure that they have a number of issues that they could raise on the U.S. side as well. Answer, no. But if we begin to define a track to uh, diplomacy and uh, channel for economic activity, 
Uh, to me, that's a lot more rational than allowing uh, hotheads on both sides to carry the day. Thank you. Yep. And we have the last question here. The last question. That's an awesome responsibility. <laughs> Hi, I'm Edward. I'm a first year student and I have a question relating to data and e-commerce. So I've learned that recently uh, a lot of big companies are collecting a lot of data on their users, especially big e-commerce companies like Amazon, for instance. Uh, do you see this as an opportunity for these massive companies to enact perfect price discrimination against their, produce, uh, against their consumers, excuse me? And if not, uh, is there a more optimistic way of viewing uh, the data that they collect? Well, if you were to ask the Amazon people that question, I have nothing to do with Amazon. If you, if you were to ask the Amazon people that question, they would say, well, we provide higher efficiencies to provide benefits to consumers, right? So I guess it depends, you know, what your point of view is. But in the end, I think, you know, and I go back to the point that I raised earlier in terms of data, that companies, companies really need to be extraordinarily careful in how they, they move and mine and process and manipulate data uh, because uh, otherwise uh, uh, governments across the world are going to constrain their capacity to maneuver in the future. Uh, already, uh, many of these companies have become so extraordinarily large uh, that they'll be difficult to kind of uh, turn back uh, Amazon is a great case in point. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think that a lot of the, uh, the private sector figures with whom I interact are really smart and they get it, that uh, if they take it too far, it could, uh, they could have a backlash on their hands. So we'll see if that happens. And there are all these, uh, these countervailing forces at work. But uh, we'll see, you know, you're only a freshman, so you've got a long time to be watching this. You'll see. Fantastic. Great questions from the audience. Eric, once again, it has been truly a pleasure. Your comments without fail are always insightful and thought provoking. And as you can see, we had a packed house. As soon as you started talking, laptops came out, people were typing. So thank you once again for being here. Again, always a pleasure. Please join me in thanking Eric Peterson. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.